I am excited to be here today and looking forward to the conversation today that we will have um, talking about professional development and transferable skills, something that is valuable to everyone and anyone who is a professional and um, and in the working field. Um, before I hand it over to the panel to introduce themselves, um, we will have a leave some time at the end for some Q and A. Um, so be thinking of your questions at, throughout the panel. Um, and then from there, as far as like conversation goes, we only have an hour, which really isn't that much time when we're talking about these vast topics. Um, so I will you know, be sure to keep time and make sure that if I interject to kind of keep us on task, um, just be prepared for that. I'm not trying to I love cut that you off. I go off task all the time. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to the panel to introduce themselves. Uh, hi, I'm Gabriela Sorret Campos. I use she, her, her pronouns. Um, and first off, like, welcome everyone. It's, uh, you know, early on a, just early in the week. Um, so I'm Gabriela. I am the global head of talent and people strategy at Chronosphere. Uh, we're a B2B company in this, um, a B2B SaaS company in the observability space. Um, prior to that, I was at an e-commerce company doing a similar role. Um, and then I used to run a boutique leadership development company. Um, but basically, even from, from my day, early days in the hospitality, I've always been curious about people. Um, people, how they work together, what makes them tick. Um, I just kind of love the, the messiness of, of, of people and, and getting to see people and companies come together and see what magic can be created. Um, so just super excited to be here. Awesome. Uh, Krista Van Ranst, I'm the founder and learning business partner for Building People. And as we're talking about, you know, the professional development piece, it is all around building people. Our focus is around specifically small and medium-sized businesses and our hope and belief that uh, all of the amazing things that can come from small and medium-sized businesses can be advanced through learning and development, uh, talent development, transferable skills, being able to be utilized within those small and medium-sized businesses. Great. Awesome. We're about to kick off a great conversation, I can tell. Um, so to start off, let's, um, you know, as far as a good question to open up the forum, um, when is retraining and reallocating your workforce necessary? When does it work and when doesn't it? You want me to start? <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I can start if you want. Um, I mean, I think all the time, right? Like uh, you shouldn't wait to to retrain. There shouldn't be an incident or an issue. And right now, a lot of people are talking about it, like the, the macroeconomic state, downturn economy, right? There's a more focus on it. But I think there's there's always opportunity. I don't even think of it as like retraining or reskilling. It's more of a, we're constantly enhancing our skills. We're constantly growing because the world's evolving, right? Uh, you know, innovation, technology, everything's shifting. So if we're not constantly upscaling, we're kind of lagging behind. Yeah, I tend to think of learning and development as like, inflation right that the, like inflation is always happening and if you're not upskilling your folks or yourself at we'll say at least 10 percent, and what what that looks like for all of you might be different but then you're probably getting behind you're slowing down you're not being as effective i mean so many of the technologies that are coming out with chat gbt and all of the other things like we've got to continually just stay on top of it and if you kind of get behind it feels like then you're going to have to just continue to learn at that much at that different pace than maybe you were at that 10 percent i love how you like the thinking of it as inflation i think yeah. that's like so smart because it's something that that i think like it or not we all have to have to you know uh work in a world with inflation um i used to have a, a leader and they would describe it as it was kind of intimidating at first when I was I was more junior in my career, but I loved the visual of it, of, especially in these hyper-growth companies, these startups. Like, we know the role changes so quickly, yes. right? Everything changes so fast. And so they would say, hey, you're doing a great job right now, but your trajectory of your role has to match the trajectory of what we need in this company, right? So, like, if our goals are not changing by X percentage, imagine your seat just grew by that percentage. And that visual, I think, is so yeah. Yeah. Um, really tied to kind of what you were saying. I love that. That's yeah. a great point. Great point. Great. On like thinking about it from like an interest perspective, right? Like if you think about credit cards that you have to pay, you're either going to, if you, if you pay it up front or, or like investing, right? If you pay now, that interest will, will help you down the line. Whereas if you're not paying now, if you're not learning now, it's going to cost you that, that interest is still there and you have the opportunity to take it or, or leave it based yes. on, on kind of getting ahead of it or having to be behind. Those are great points. So how do you evaluate when to design or lead training 
internally versus bringing in an outside resource to train. If you don't have the budget to bring an outside resource, what are some key steps for lower cost options that you that companies can take? Yeah, so I am a big believer in like, what's the time you need this to become like sufficient or or have an understanding of it? And if it is, you know, three to six months that you need your folks to be sufficient, you should probably try and find an expert to bring in. Another option from a cost perspective, a cost savings is to send one of your employees to maybe an open enrollment or a program that be like, maybe it's a, a conference or, or something that you can just send one employee and be like, all right, you know, X, Y, and Z person, I need you to, to take studious notes. I need you to try and take in as much knowledge as, as possible. And then we're going to schedule, you know, something a week or two after, while it's still a little bit more fresh in your brain for you to share this information out to the team as much of it as you possibly can. Um, but definitely I think that that three to six month time frame for me is like, if you need that, if you need to be up and running in a new skill set within that time frame, spend the money now in the same instance of the, the interest versus if you have a little bit more time, six to 12 months, maybe it's something that you can teach and bring in house. So I've been on both sides of that coin. I ran a leadership development firm that we worked with a lot of different hyper growth companies here in Boston, uh, mainly around the East coast, but you know, all over the, the country. Um, and have also been, you know, leading talent teams and people teams internally. So I've worked with vendors and I've also been the one that's selling into, into companies. Um, and for me, it really comes down to like resources, right? I think in an ideal world, yes, we'll invest in training or bring in the best expert. But oftentimes at companies, especially on people, talent, HR teams, we're resource constrained, right? That's, that's kind of just the reality of it. Um, so for me, it's more of a look at your resources and what are you trying to accomplish, right? And what do those things meet them in middle? Um, I also like a kind of a hybrid program. I try to bring in experts where we maybe, so the way I think of it is like, what are the core skills where I think it's really, really important that we have our own kind of fingerprint on it, right? Like sometimes, um, you know, there, there's certain things that are, there's tried and true trainings that you can bring in experts, but there's some things that are a little bit more integral to the core and you want to have a little bit more ownership. So I try to separate it that way of like the essentiality, the what's really essential for everyone and what are some things that maybe this department needs or that department needs or this individual versus that individual. Um, Separate to that, I think that, you know, really trying to figure out like what's a combination because people learn so differently, right? Some, one person might learn from a video. Another person needs to hear it the 10 different times from def 10 different ways. Someone else needs to do it. So I like to like mix a lot of mediums and give people a lot of different avenues. So that's almost, so where you're almost stacking the deck in your favor, right? Because if you have a lot of things that are teaching the, the same framework and the language is similar, the way people are ingesting that's going to be a little bit different. Um, and, and so I think the other thing too is cost effective aspects exist, right? I've, I, they absolutely do. Um, one of my favorite things to do, because again, I've, I've been in places where I've had absolutely zero budget, right? It was like, of course you're going to have a budget, come in, build a team. They're like, <laughs> kidding. Um, but we're going to work our way to that budget. Um, but, but so even little things, like I think there's, there's some pillars that you can use that go across the entire life cycle, not just learning and development. So something is like competency-based hiring, competency-based training. So if you have a role and you're thinking, I need person in on this team, right? Um, let's say it's it's sales or uh, even like say, I, again, whatever, make up the team, whatever it is. Um, but if you have people coming in, so often people look at a job description online and say, oh yeah, that job description looks good. I've never hired a, a generalist before. I've never hired a, someone to run onboarding before. And they go through like, you know, like we're all moving really, really quickly. They start doing Google search and they're like, they pick apart these job descriptions and that's how they put theirs together. I like to go back to basics and say, what are the actual competencies and skills that you need for this role? Um, and then when you know those are the competencies and skills, that's actually your map for how you need to train them in learning and development. So I personally, like one of my favorite resources, and I don't know if I'm allowed to like plug different companies, um, but like Corn Ferry, right? Corn Ferry has a competency uh, dictionary. It used to be like Lomingers or Lomingers. I don't, never know how to say it, but they consolidated these three different uh, uh, competency dictionaries. I use, I think it's called the FYI, it's the Forward Information Book. It's literally on my shelf. I buy it for every single person on my team because in there I found when I was a team of one, uh, um, you know, at a at an organization, it was a way for me to help scale myself because I couldn't be in every conversation of learning and development. I couldn't be in every performance plan conversation. I couldn't be in every coaching conversation, which meant that usually you deploy HR people 
with uh, if you have a problem, right? This isn't working out. I need to, you know, assistance, usually moving someone out or, or, or once it's, it's a little bit more tenuous. Um, and that's not where we should be investing our time, right? You want to invest your time with people that are adding a lot of value. So again, even a book like that, it has competencies, it has job aids, it gives you skills, and it breaks it all down. It makes it super, super easy. And it costs like maybe $95. Um, which is, you know, much cheaper than a lot of different learning and development programs. And it's, it's possible. It's there. You can do it. I swear. Great. And Krista, did you want to add to that? Because I know we were talking about this earlier. About <laughs> I was just going to say, Luciana and, Luciana and I were talking earlier of like, like oftentimes we're trying to hire so quickly and what that eventually is. So if we're hiring really, really quickly and we're not really focused on like what is the role that is needed and what are all of those skills that they need to have versus that they can adapt and learn from. From a learning and development perspective, we're continuing to recreate the wheel over and over when folks are hiring the wrong people for those roles, right? Like we're trying to con like continually increase the benchmark from a learning and development perspective of what your folks know. And if you're constantly hiring people just that maybe have a pulse or that like fit the job for now, we're constantly having to recreate and retrain on those topics. And so taking a little bit of Louisiana and I were talking about like taking a little bit of time or more time up front is going to save you so much time, so much money down the line to really make sure that you're getting the right people. The one last thing I'll say around like cost savings that I, I should have mentioned before is that in Massachusetts in particular, but technically in every state, there are amazing training grants that for-profit companies can apply for, for training funds. So in Massachusetts, if you are under 100 employees, you can ask for $20,000 a year to train your people. And that's through the Massachusetts Express Grant. It's an awesome program, super easy to apply for. You just have to be in business for two years. If you're over 100 employees, you can ask for 200,000 in funds. And that's over a two-year time frame. That's not a small amount of money. And, you know, if, Absolutely. if, <laughs> if Gabriella can do something with $95, imagine what That's you right. can do with 200,000. Well, right? and, and with that too, to your point, so many states have those grants. It also forces you to project because the most difficult thing about the grants is you have to kind of notate, I think we're going to have X amount of people in this type of training. It's going to cost around this much money. So a lot of people don't like it because it forces you to think ahead of how much do I think I'm going to be spending on this grant, uh, on this type of training, which means you have to imagine your future workforce. You have to imagine the skills that you need in the future. So a lot of people don't take advantage of those grants because they exist, but they're, you know, it's like a, anyone who's done grant writing knows that, that sometimes it's, it's less, a little bit less fun, um, but it forces you to think a little bit differently. So I think a lot of people avoid it, even though it is, you know, money that's accessible because it, you, you have to get the company, because it's not just about the person, the head of learning and development. You have to ask all of your different department heads, like, where do you think you're going to invest? What is that team going to look like? X amount of time from now. So if you're a little bit more established or if you have a general idea of skills, um, it's a great thing to take advantage of. Yeah. And do you help people or companies or would you work with companies if they were like looking to figure out how to do the grant? Yeah. Is that something? No plug, but yes, 100%. That is Amazing. what we do. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thank you. So moving on um, to an, another big question that we had um, thought about is specifically now speaking to the employees and employees who want to pivot their skills or careers within their current company, how do you recommend they go about the conversations and training to do so? I mean, so are, are we saying how do they, like they already know what they want to do and how do they start the process in the company or how do we even get them knowing that that's, that's a possibility? What's, that's, what's I mean, that's a great question, right? Because we want to look at not only like the moment now and like the next couple of years, but also big picture, right? Yeah. Um, I would say in terms of individuals who know where they want to go, um, but aren't you know, currently there yet. Current, aren't currently there yet. So maybe for our hypotheticals, someone who's in sales and wants to move into marketing, which is one that I usually see yeah. a lot happen often, right? How how would you approach that conversation, or what advice would you give someone to put it there? I mean, I think from an organizational perspective, that's why I love competencies. And, and again, maybe this came from being resource constrained. Um, but but initially, right, if you start building that competency dictionary, and you're saying, oh, we're hiring X Y. XYZ role in marketing, these are the competencies that I need for this role. These are the competencies that we need for this role. And you're hiring to those, you almost start coming up with this competency map. And we used to publish ours internally and say, hey, these are the core skills or the core competencies that 
that we see across this job family, this job family. So it really helped with that career lattice because people could see, oh, I want to invest in this skill set. And since we had you know, like that, that book that I was plugging, um, I could tell people, oh, you want to grow in this skill? Cool. Here's some exercise. Here's some things that you can do. Here's some projects that maybe we could have you do. Here's some stretch assignments that you can flex into. What I typically see, and I don't know if this is because I've, I typically work more in the uh, you know, again, in rapid growth, like super small startups that are in hyper growth. Um, I, I often find that some of the technical roles people and, and kind of this could be a gross uh, kind of stereotyping and really broad brushstrokes. But oftentimes there are certain functions where people there's a little bit more of the I don't know if I want to go down the path of management or individual contributor. I don't know what niche, but it's definitely going to be within this field. Sometimes I see a little bit more on the GNA or the go to market side. It's a little bit more of a I'm kind of open to anything. I don't know. This is what I'm going to do for the next two, five years, but let's see what's, what's going to happen in the world. Um, so I think there's actually a responsibility for the organization, um, or at least I, I like to take this on, where what can we do to really help someone increase some self-awareness, especially because there's a lot of people that take the roles that are more entry level or more developing in their skills. So it's really also like where they are in their career trajectory. So it's like, what tools can we give them from uh, uh, you know self-exploration to really kind of understand even what they want to do? Because- Again, maybe it's the people that I surround myself with, a lot of them don't know what, yeah. what they want to do. Um, and then also, what's the company vision? What are we going after as an organization? What's our North Star? And what's that mission that we're trying to accomplish in the next three, five, 10 years? Um, and for me, it's more of a, look, we're going to give you this. You're going to have this awareness. We're going to give you this set. Um, and what I love about startups is there are teams, there are departments that are going to exist tomorrow that weren't even a thought a quarter ago, right? Yeah. So if you're curious about something, you're like, ooh, this is a problem the company needs to solve and I have a skill set here or a curiosity even better, like match those things together. Um, and that's, I think, where it becomes really explosive and powerful. Yeah, love that. And I think in particular, if for people that don't know or just like thinking about that career change, I think one of the biggest things is letting people know. I think Oftentimes we put so much pressure on managers and leaders of organizations that, oh, like when the role is the, the perfect fit for me is available, mm -hmm. my manager is going to know and they're going to automatically give it. They may not. And like, and that is an opportunity, one, for maybe you to manage up, but two, to say, you know what, I need to let them know what I want, what I'm looking for, so that when that opportunity does arise, they say, you know what? There's Emily over there. She wanted that. And, and I remember this conversation. Let's see if she's the right fit. Um, because I think so often they want to give you all of those opportunities, but they're not 100% sure what you're looking for. Maybe they think you want to stay in a similar career path where actually you're looking to move off in the sales marketing example that you just gave. And so it's hard, I think, for folks to, to think like, oh, if I tell them I want to go some like into a different department, they're not going to put as much... Um, they're not going to give me as much time. They're not going to spend as much uh, attention on me in the current role that I'm in. That's not necessarily the case. I hope that's not the case from a manager's perspective, that they still want to uh, give you those skills and spend that time. And also to see, hey, even if they switch into a different role or into a different department, the knowledge is staying within the organization versus going out and losing it all together. And I think it's just important to think from both sides, the the management leadership side, as well as that employee side, that like you want to be in a place where you can have those conversations, where you can trust that your manager has your your best interests at heart, but also that they don't know what they don't know. And so you've got to share that information out. I, I love that you brought up managers. I feel like it's so, uh, sometimes I talk to, to people that are starting off in leadership development or management and they want to know all the answers, right? They're like, I just want to know it all, right? If my, someone asks me something, I just want to know and I, I want to be the know. best manager. Yeah. And they put so much <laughs> pressure on themselves. And it's just like, you don't need to know the answer. You just need to know how to ask the question. So I, for me, when it comes to the, the people on your team and developing them, just even asking the question of where, where do you see yourself? And then also not feeling that, that pressure. Because I think for some people new in their career, there's a lot of pressure there. So from the onset, I try to encourage people, like, you have to pioneer your own path, right? Because ultimately, I guess, you know, it's, it's your life, right? You can have the best managers in the world and people that want to delineate your path and they're going to help you and you have all the sponsors and the best network. But it still might not be fulfilling if you haven't really determined what you want. So kind of really encouraging individuals, like, take a moment and think about it, right? Where do you feel fulfilled? Where, where What excites you? Um, I was the, the person that I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I was a, such a people pleaser. Someone's like, you should do this. And I was like, okay. And, and then I would realize like, oh, I no, I didn't enjoy that at all. But this is what work is, right? Like someone tells you just something, you do it. And it wasn't until I was later in my career that I was like, oh, 
I should have actually reflected on what I enjoyed and what I wanted to do instead of just like being a, right. a yeser. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. So normalizing the conversation between managers and employees to like, let's talk about career development. What does that look like? Giving, you know, from an employee perspective, giving the hiring manager an opportunity to help invest that time to find bullets for your resume yeah. to get you there. Um, I love that. That was and one thing you just said, sorry, sorry to. No, you're good. Um, and then I have to piggyback that. on something yeah. you said. So keep going. Well, so so um, you just made me think of one-on-ones when you were saying like that bullet pointed and you're talking to the manager in the conversation, right? How many of you have one-on-ones with, with your managers or with your people? We all do, right? Or I shouldn't say we Hopefully. all do. Uh, the majority of people do. I, I typically don't speak in absolutes, so I apologize. Um, so, you know, most often people are doing that on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. And I see so many one-on-ones that become a, a a status update, mm. right? Oh, that project check, 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 check. So I remember, I mean, this was super early on and I'm so grateful for this leader. This leader was like, look, if I didn't think you could do the job, I wouldn't have hired you for it. So if you have an issue, if you have a concern, bring it up to me, but I trust that you're going to do it. So I don't need your status updates. This is your time, right? So you come up with what you want to talk about. So I love preserving those one-on-ones for dialogue. And, and if, if it's dialogue about what's where are you stuck? Where do you, where, where, what do you want to do more? And where do you want to be as an individual? It makes it easier to have that career conversation and have it be ongoing. Because if you're just doing status update, status update, then it feels like that weird, oh, it's review time. Yeah. Let's have that conversation about career. And it can be like added yeah. pressure. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things that you brought up was like that people pleaser piece, right? That you're like, oh yeah, I'll just, like they think I should do this. Okay, great. I think there are a decent amount of folks that they see that the career path is that you have to go from kind of individual contributor to, to manager, to leader, right? And so they continue doing that either because that's what they feel is the path or because folks are like, you're so great at this. We're going to put you into yeah. it. Like, you should be a manager. And so you're like, okay, I'm going to do that. And I have seen, I've had more and more conversations recently with folks who have said, you know what? I don't want to be a manager. Like they've done it and they've realized the people thing is hard. Like yeah. what you said at the beginning, like you love messy. the like messiness of it. Right. But a lot of folks get in there and like, you know what? I like the clean. I don't mm -hmm. want all that messy. I just want to keep being this, like, you know, an excellent engineer. And I think it's important that organizations realize how can we create another path for folks that is maybe just an individual contributor, but I'm going to become an expert individual contributor that people are going to come to me for all of the answers. And that's who I want to be versus the manager who feels like they have to have all the answers, yeah. but maybe doesn't. Well, and with that, I can't tell you how many times I've had that conversation of, when someone's like, you know, I really want to be a manager, Gabby, I want to do this. And just saying like, hey, what is it about management that attracts you? Yeah. What is it about that role that attracts you? And sometimes we were like, well, the it's the power. next thing. There's this. Or like, <laughs> or sometimes they're really honest. like, well, it's, I, I need more money. I want yeah. this. Or I, yes. want to I want to have a bigger impact. Well, what does impact mean to you? And then there's some people that you're just like, oh, so you don't like it. And, and just having them unpack it of like where they can find solutions of if that's really your goal, there's probably other avenues to get that. And then there's some people that are like, Oh man, I get so fulfilled when I answer this person's question. I taught them how to do this and that. And then you're like, okay, they that's gonna give them some energy back. So yeah. Love and that's that. a key for hiring great uh, managers. Because yeah. a lot of times they yeah. might be great at a skill, but that people piece is missing. And then, well, we know what the domino effect of that could be. So yeah. <laughs> uh, great. That, I mean, that was a great um, the great answers and great points all around. Um, in keeping things moving to the next question. We're just like on question two. You're probably like, <laughs> I mean, it's only 8 30. We just found 20 grand. We grab a great book that we're all going to go out and buy. <laughs> we're doing great. We're doing great. Um, when it comes to workforce planning and gap analysis, what are the critical factors that HR professionals and executives should consider to ensure the organization has the right talent in the right place for the future needs? We kind of touched upon this a little bit. So, yeah. I, I think like yeah. a lot of the pieces that competency mapping, right? And like 100%. thinking about it in, in advance. I think the other piece is what Louisiana and I had talked about before of like really spending that time up front to make sure that you're hiring for the right yeah. folks. Um, and when you're not, I think like we could potentially speak to that a little bit further that like, all right, so you didn't have that chance to do that beforehand. And now you're, you've sat in this room and you know that you're going you're gonna to spend some additional time. But if you've got some folks who are already hired and maybe they're not the best fit, yeah. and so we've got some gaps, are they a good fit for a different area? Like what, I'm a big believer in hiring for adaptability. I think especially right now, 
what are those skills that they can that are adaptable that they can move to another piece in the, in the business, another department, another role, whatever that looks like. And so understanding the competency mapping, and I'll let you speak to that in a moment, like is really, really helpful, but saying, all right, what are these strengths? What lights that person up? And is there an opportunity for there to be a specific role? Maybe it's a little bit more well-defined and, and very specific, or maybe it's more of that generalist yeah. role. I mean, I think especially even right now, you know, we've seen this year, there have been a lot of layoffs in the tech space, right? Um, so I think it's not only as you're downsizing, but even if you're growing as an organization, um, I like to start at the macro level. What are we trying to accomplish? And I got a lot of questions from people as they were going through, you know, riffs or, or going through that kind of earlier uh, this year and last year. And they're saying like, well, what's what's the right way, right? Do we start with, is it tenure? Is it, uh, you know, the last one in, is first one out? And, you know, and there's all these like, this is the right way it should be. And, and to me, it's like, Throw all those things out the window. I mean, I'm sure they're, they're, there's definitely value to them, but it's what are we trying to accomplish as a company, right? What are the, at the macro level, what are like the OKRs of the organization? And then what are the skills or what are the groups that you need to achieve those things? And I start there. And then it kind of goes down to absolutely the competencies, the skills. Um, also like group and working dynamics is really important as well. Like there, you could have someone that's, someone that might be uh, a 10 out of 10 on solving problems, but if they are someone that's a little bit more toxic and takes away from the group, I'd rather have someone who's adaptable, flexible, curious, even if they can't work at that velocity, if they're better for the team dynamic. Now, mind you, there might be some problems that you need that technical or, or not even technical, but any type of expert in the field because you have problems that only a few people can solve. So really unpacking, like, what are we trying to accomplish? Where do we need to go and starting, starting there? Um, I think that's the big piece. The other thing that I, I love when you were talking about like transferring people around the organization, it made me think of something that's a little bit off kilter, but by this time, <laughs> you know, probably figured out that I love standard. going off topics. <laughs> Give me a tangent. I'll, I'll jump on that tangent. Um, there's, there's been research that's been done that shows that oftentimes for um, kind of historically marginalized groups, specifically from a gendered size women, a gendered uh, perspective women will look at a job description and say like, oh, I don't check all 10 of these requirements, so I'm not going to apply. And then, you know, like, and, and that, that's, that's, I have, I have read it in numerous studies, but I've also seen it, right? I've seen it in different groups. I've been on different teams that I've been on. So oftentimes I have companies that are doing that also internally and they're like, oh, I'm posting these internal job transfers or I'm asking my team, we might have this opportunity here. Um, and you might see that not everyone raises their hand because you're going to have some people that the same way they look at that job description, they're like, well, do I do all 10 of these things? Excellent. You know, it, it's important to have that dialogue of, and notice, right? I think just observing whether you're a leader or, I mean, honestly, it doesn't matter for what position you're in. Um, but, but to me, a leader is anyone who has some type of, of influence and curiosity within an organization. Look around. Like, I love looking at someone that's like, really great, right? I, I, I want to sit there and be like, man, that person's like super fabulous at this. And then just articulating that and telling them that like, you have like a superpower in this one area because sometimes they don't even recognize yeah. it, right? And then you can think about where could that be transferable? So for me, for the, the manager, it's not about having the answer, but if you see someone that maybe is uncertain, I like to look at like, do I see opportunities or based on those transferable skills? Because maybe that opens up a doorway or even a window where they can get curious about something else that they might might be skilled at because you know we're all we're all a little bit different. Awesome, thank you. Love it. So when it comes to talent talent acquisition and uh, learning development, how can talent acquisition and people leaders collaborate to create personalized career development plans for employees based on their interests, strengths, and aspirations? Yeah. So I think so often there feels like there's like a silo sometimes in HR when, when people are moving so quickly that they aren't collaborating necessarily. But that, that talent acquisition team, right? They, they really get to know these new potential hires very well in a short period of time. They're asking so many questions. They have so many notes. And then you just like, that information often isn't shared with the people who are going to focus on their learning and development for the company for the rest of their careers there, right? And so if there could be that kind of quick meet and greet of, okay, this person's starting, this is the kind of maybe the standard onboarding plan that we have for this type of role, 
what additional in, like pieces of insight could you share with me? What additional, um, maybe there's a couple of additional skills. Maybe there's some past videos that we have from the company that we've created from orientations or, or different conversations we've had in the past that we think would be valuable. Maybe there's a mentor or someone that we think that they should meet because they had these, you know, they made some notes that these were areas of interest. Kind of giving that that quick um, once over, I think is a huge piece from an onboarding. One, because when people start, I like, I like to say that on a scale of like one to 10, as companies, we think like we're, they're starting at a 10. They are super excited. They, they couldn't be happier. Often I think people are probably at a five and you as an organization have a chance to sway them in one direction or another. And oftentimes they're like day one is probably the best and then it may go downhill from there. And so I often say that I'd prefer it to be more of a cross country ski than a roller coaster, right? Like, and that you want, if, if things are going to slowly go down and then up, that it is more of that, um, a more even keel and giving them the best possible experience from the beginning will allow for that excitement to last that much longer. I mean, look, onboarding, I love that you mentioned like that day one, onboarding for any organization that's not doing even a little bit of onboarding, right? It's, it's, of th there's a high correlation of people that have strong onboardings and a good experience in onboarding and year one retention. So I'm just going to throw that out there, like investing in a little bit of training can go a long way because it's actually saving you, you money long-term. And um, like almost free. Like, so if we talk about like ways to save money, onboarding is almost free and has a huge yeah. value. So continue. yeah. And, and I mean, honestly, I'll, I'll actually go the opposite way. It's not free, right? Cause you're investing people's talent True. to do it, right? Yeah, so you're yeah. using resources, but I think of it as like the return on your investment oh. is going to far outweigh the right. cost that you're putting in. So um, when I think of it again, I, I, I think of it from that, that macro level of if it's just L and D, because so often people think learning and development is Oh, well, it's just training, right? It's that, it's that I need to do it. It's a check the box, right? And it's more of a mental shift in this. So the way I look at it is like, if you think of employees or, or your, your talent as the greatest asset an organization has, right? And that's it. I'm not saying, you know, being someone who's, who leads a people function, oftentimes the, the, um, the pers people often assumed that people leaders are soft and touchy. Right. It's like, it's like, we just want to hug everyone and make everyone happy. I might. No, I mean, I like, I, I'm like, I'm like, honestly, like, yeah, I, it's, it's great if people are happy. I think that's great from a productivity perspective, but I think of it from a business perspective, right? We are running businesses. If I wanted to work on just making people happy, I would probably work at a nonprofit and that would be my, my goal, right? Something like that. But revenue is important. I work at for-profit companies. So if I look at it, it's like, okay, this is an asset. How am I going to maximize the output of this asset? over its life cycle, right? Just like when we have a customer, we right, want to, you, you want to get, acquire that customer at the lowest cost possible when you're trying to get the most lifetime value out of that customer. I think of employees the same way. Um, so when I look at it, it's like, what are these key inflection points throughout the employee life cycle where we can invest in? And what that looks like is hiring. When you're talking about competency-based hiring, that means that if you're just hiring like general, I'm going to open the door um, and people could be great because they interview super well. And I believe that you can do the job. Maybe you luck out, cool. But if you get really, really intentional and competency-based hiring, that person's going to meet the role a little bit more effectively and their output will be higher. If you have a strong onboarding, right? Onboarding isn't just about feel good, I know where to go. It's important because people like connection. They want to feel connected to others and they want to feel connected to an organization, right? We want connection. We crave it as humans. But really, when I think of onboarding, it's about shortening ramp up time. Mm -hmm. If it takes you X amount of months for someone to hit this output, if I have a good onboarding and I shrink it by this, guess what? My output is increasing. As an organization, I am making more money, right? Now, if you think about the cultural aspects, oh, I like my managers. I feel good. This is a values-driven uh, values organization, and the values of this organization meet my values, right? Because there isn't a one-size-fits-all on values. Anyone can find a company that works for them because we all have different values. Just find something that, that works. Then my overall happiness will increase so that the likelihood that I will stay at that organization longer based on the culture and the leadership is going to, to increase. So to me, it's all of those different aspects coming together. It's not just learning and development in a silo. You have to think about like, there is a business case for it. It is going to lead to, to increase or it could lead to increased profitability and productivity if it's done well. So it's really thinking about those different aspects and those inflection points. And I like when you were saying like, how long does it take to, to ramp up? Right. So Oftentimes I think of like six months is the standard. I think they say that people, it takes people to onboard and to get up to, to speed. 
So remember the other, the other expense that you have is all of that team that is working with that new hire and them having to take on more of that person's role until they get up to speed. So if you can shrink that down, the rest of the team is, is less likely to get burnt out by doing other people's jobs. I love that you bring that up too. The other thing that's going to happen there, right? And I love a good model. Uh, Tuckman's model on team development, right? Every time you're adding that new person to the team, guess what? That, that a new team, well, a new team I would say is even forming. Yeah. Right? No, that new right. Team, is, team is forming because you're adding a new player. So you can add the top player. I mean, it doesn't always work out like Inter Miami, right? Where you add a rock star and all of a sudden things start working out. It doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes you could add a rock star to a team and it's like, why? I had a flow. Where is that? Where is that going? So really going back to, okay, this new team is forming. We have to go through storming. And one of the ways you do that is, roles, responsibilities, skill sets, competencies, clearly defining what people are, the outputs are. So as a manager, it almost feels repetitive, but it's because you're adding new people in and making those expectations of learning, development, training, where we're investing in you, where you're coming back to us can really help the team accelerate. And one thing, so for anyone that doesn't know Tuckman's model, just quickly, um, forming, storming, norming, performing into to having high performing teams. And one of the things to think about as managers is when you go through that storming phase, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, crap, you know, we've got this team. And once again, you know, there's there's conflict and like it's getting messy. I'm going to continue using that word. It, it's this is this is a real it, we're really, really frustrated because the team isn't jiving. I want this team to be thriving. I want them to be amazing. Now that you know, or now that you've heard very quickly Tuckman's model, the storming is necessary. You can't go over it. You can't go under it. You have to go through it. So as managers or even as teams, get excited when that messiness happens because that's your opportunity to take it to the next level and actually become norming and then performing, right? Like you can't just have this happy-go-lucky um a honeymoon phase all the time, like, but making sure that you're intentional about getting through it. Sidebar, we'll do a little workshop on storming. On a, no, um, <laughs> but, but with that too, though, right? I love that you said you have to go through it. You can't go over, you can't go under it, mm. but you can get stuck in it. Yes. And, and then, absolutely get stuck in it, right? And just stuck in that loop. So it's like, how do we think about healthy conflict, right? So uh, this is also goes back to, to um, kind of the reskilling of employees. It's not all a training, right? It's not all, we are now going to learn this management training course. We're now going to learn this like feedback. There, but it's it's more of this like, how do you teach teams to, to have dialogue, right? To like, yeah. to feel comfortable challenging each other in a way that's not about challenging the person, but challenging the idea, right? Can you create that psychological safety? Because so much of your learning and development, so much of that comes from just being in the job, working in groups, right? Yeah. So much of it is coming from that. So if you can have a healthier team, you're going to have increased productivity and they're constantly learning. It becomes a learning culture yeah. versus a, oh, I'm going to this L&D program. And that's how I like to think of it is like learning is an everyday, all day aspect. Yeah. We have to reframe to think of it that way versus seeing learning as event. a department, a training. Oh, there's a table, there's a, you know, tablecloth on a, <laughs> on a table. So now I'm in my learning mode. Right. And a free meal. You got to have the free meal just for that. <laughs> it, doesn't, it does increase attendance. So you mentioned you could also get stuck in storming really briefly. Like what would be some, you know, strategies or examples of, um, advice you would give teams to help work through that? So, I mean, um, when I was mentioning earlier, kind of like talking about roles and responsibilities. So like, usually it's like clarity of the goal. So when people say like from, from uh, a forming, so you can think of it like, I, I see this even in like sports teams for like ch children, right? If you could think back to the first sport team you were on, right? The first, it's like, hey coach, look at me, I can do this well. Cause we're all trying to show up and show our best selves, right? So that's forming. We're all kind of playing nice. Um, storming is now we've kind of let, let the playing nice come off and we're trying to figure out where we fit. And there might be some, some tension between, hey, well, I was doing this or, but I was the rock star at my other company or now is this person that person? So it can feel a little bit like there's some conflict there. So typically what they say is you want to clarify what the outputs are. You want to clarify roles and responsibilities, right? And that's one of the key things is just by that clarification, people start understanding the swim lanes. And if they know that unifying goal, it becomes more of the we versus the me. Um, and once it gets to that we and they can start seeing it there, Again, it doesn't get perfect. Then it goes into like, okay, now now it's become normalized. Um, and then you get into that that performance type of, of flow. But again, every time you add a new person to that mix, you're renegotiating that. Because it's not just that when I say roles and responsibilities, there's the, the written ones or the, the 
clearly articulated ones that's like, oh, in your role, you have to do X, Y, Z. But there's also these group dynamic roles that we play, right? Like, so um, I, as you can tell, I'm, I play the quiet <laughs> person in the corner that, that is, you know, doesn't speak up often, but no, I'm, but I, 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 I know where I fit on teams, right? I wish I was the person that was a little bit more structured. I'm always like, man, I was, wish I was more of a concise speaker, but there are people that like when they speak, they captivate the room. Um, so you kind of learn like where, where, and, and not in a negative way or a bad way. I think it's more of just like learning where you fit. Yeah. Um, with the team. So I think there's the emotional aspect that can also help you with the psychological safety of, of that space in that group. Thank you. The, the quick thing that I'll, that I'll add there. So one, a lot of the um, clients that I have are in the construction industry. And so from a, like there might be a project manager and a superintendent and maybe an assistant project manager and assistant superintendent. And so you have roles that a lot of their skills or even their job descriptions are very similar. And depending, they could have the same bullets or competencies on each, right? And so it's important to be having those conversations of like, okay, normally I like I do this task, but I am going to like, you know, maybe there's butting of heads because two people are doing the exact same tasks. One, that's a huge waste of time. But two, like they might be doing that because they see that that was what they were told to do and they're not having a conversation of like, no, only one of us should, should be doing this. The thing that's really important in the storming piece and the forming and storming, the manager, is, it's probably one of the manager's most important times to be active on those projects, in those departments, in those roles. If they can then get through that storming phase, the manager can take a step back and spend a lot less time with that team or potentially leave the company and they can still remain norming or high performing, right? But they need, the manager is really, really important in those first two phases to get, help folks get through that storming phase often. Thank you. All right. Now we talked about ROI, um, you know, when it came to onboarding and um, shifting it a little bit more towards how do you how do can companies measure the success and ROI of their retraining and retention programs? What metrics should be tracked to evaluate their impact on the organization's performance and bottom line? I mean, I think the I, I thought the typical metrics people were using were like revenue per employee, cost per hour, things of that nature. To me, I like to measure um, which, which are still important. I'm not knocking sure, those, those sure. metrics at all. Um, but again, for me, I, I typically work in rapid growth more tech startups, right? Where to your point, like oftentimes they do say, yeah, ramp does take six months, but you know what? In a lot of startups, you don't get six months. It's like, yeah. guess right. what? You're, you're starting today and we need you to start hitting this in a month. Yeah. Um, and so the way I think of it is, it's again, it's measuring how long does it take to do something. So I think that's often missing. What I typically see in, in learning development, it's like, do you feel that you learn something, right? And it becomes a little bit more of a qualitative conversation, which I think that's kind of like more for the feels. Um, what I like is, again, I'm an operator, right? I'm like, a, what, how is it impacting my bottom line? So I like looking at it and saying, okay, this used to take, if I was taking my sales team through this type of training and they would typically hit this metric and this was the average and I expect them to hit that in like mm -hmm. three months, what trainings can I put in? And it's, if it's shorting that, even if it's shorting it by two days, right. right? You look at the number of people that you have there, what their cost is every day, like, and you can actually put a numerical value to that. It becomes a little bit more difficult. I think actually for me, you may have some, I'm sure you have some great ideas on this, but measuring the success of leadership development, I always found that a little bit more challenging because I think when there's strong leadership and great leadership, everything just seems to work. Yeah. Right. So there's so many different factors that you can attribute it to. It's not just, oh, there's a great leader. There's a great leader, but there's also a great team. There's probably a great product. Maybe the market's in a really right place. But when things are falling apart, it can almost be the finger pointed back to, to a leader. There could be other aspects as well, but a lot of problems can be fixed through leadership. So I think that's the one that can be a little bit difficult to, to measure. But I also like to look at, you know, to me, it's, it's a little bit more comprehensive because again, people, like I said, are, are messy and the, the space that I work in, there's so much change, right? The, yeah. the manager that you work for today might not be the manager they're working for three months from now or six months from now because it's really this rapid growth space. Um, so I like looking at engagement retention scores. Um, I do, we do, uh, and I encourage companies to do uh, quarterly retros or do have the, the feedback conversation way more often than once a year. So we look at that. We're doing talent reviews on a quarterly basis and we're mapping all of these things and even as pulse surveys to start getting a better idea of, are people feeling like they're excited about what the work right. that they're doing? 
they feel capable and they have the aptitude and the skills to be able to do that work. And then their output's actually there in a way that's measurable and letting the company kind of hit um, right. it, its goals. When those things are coming together, I feel like that's that's how I measure kind of the, the efficacy of, of some of these programs. Awesome. I'll do this quickly because I know we're running low on time, but um, I, I tend to think of learning and development, the, I, like our goals are the goals of the business. And so it's really asking the questions of like, if I were to measure where we're currently at now versus where we're going to be in a year, what does that look like? And so like often it's amazing how many organizations don't have really measurable goals, like defined goals that they know, okay, a year from now, this is where we're going to be. So really digging in and maybe asking like why multiple times. And when I think of leadership development, so many people reach out and they're like, hey, we want to do, if, if we're writing a grant or if they're one of our clients, we want to do a manager development program. Awesome. Why? Why do you want, like, oh, because, you know, they've never had a formal training. Okay. Why? <laughs> you know, like, why do you want this? What are you hoping for them to achieve? And thinking about just some measurables to give you examples of, oftentimes with leadership development, I would agree that it can be more difficult. But I think one way, if you are going to have a leadership development or a manager development program, at the end, adding in some sort of project that each of those leaders has to accomplish. And maybe that's like, all right, we, there are some new initiatives that we want this organization to bring about, either you know, as people that are a part of this program, we want each one of you, each of you to bring one or two ideas to the table of new initiatives or new goals that you're hoping to accomplish. Or if you don't have any ideas, maybe we as an organization have a couple and you can cherry pick from those. And then maybe it's like halfway through the manager or leadership program, they begin to build out their project. And by the end of it, because they're learning about change, they're learning about motivation, they're learning about delegation, they're learning about whatever these topics are that are leadership focused, they will have to kind of fully plan out their project and see if it goes to fruition. Then you have some real metrics to say, okay, before this program, we um, didn't have a department or an initiative or uh, an area that we wanted to like test out. And now we have that and it's done X, Y, or Z. For some organizations that we have, they have major expenses that were unanticipated. And so we look at like, okay, what were their budgets like um, last year? And, and were, what were their anticipated budgets like? And then what did they become? If you wanted to reduce those by 20%, would that be advantageous? And so like, okay, here's a great way that we're actually saving you money now versus costing you money. And one last point with, with this whole thing, if you're running a company, Rex, I know we have different people in the, in the audience here. I would say from a people perspective, um, I like to bring on someone in people analytics super early on. So we've been looking at, again, the trend. It's not just a moment in time, how someone doing, but what's the trend and what's the movement over time? Um, and then with leadership development programs, the one thing that, again, it's not it's not perfect, but doing an ENPS on someone beforehand, then doing a training program and doing that and tracking that over time, are they actually having behavior changes um, that are impacting people in a positive way? Tell them what an ENPS is. Oh, um, it's Employee Net Promoter Score. So Net Promoter Score, if you haven't read the book, The Ultimate Question, it's great. So they found this one question. You've probably seen it. You've definitely, well, I shouldn't say definitely, you most likely answered it somewhere. But it's a question that is both, a, can act as a leading indicator, but it's also a lagging metric that um, will, can be an indicator as to how often, just the success of the company, because the question's around like, would you refer to this? Right. So it's the on a scale of zero to 10, how likely would you be to refer blank, blank, blank to family, friend, colleague, et cetera. Um, and so there's a way of calculating that. Um, but like it goes across like so, you know, whether it's Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or Costco, they all had like strong uh, NP NPS, not ENPS, but N like net promoter scores. Mm -hmm. Southwest Airlines had a strong one, Apple computers. But you saw it cut across all these different industries. Again, just read the book. Ultimate question. It's great. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so we want to turn it over to some questions. Um, any, uh, yes. Rachel. So what we're going to do is we'll take some in-person questions and some virtual questions as well. So we'll start it off with in-person and then we do have a Q&A tab that folks have been dropping some questions in um, throughout the duration of the presentation. So we'll go back and forth for a couple minutes and then certainly um, for anyone in attendance, all of our speaker information, if you visit Startup Boston website, if you visit any of our socials, you should be able to connect with our fabulous speakers today as well if there's any follow-up. Um, but I did see a hand. Can I pass <laughs> it off to you? Perfect. Um, I love this topic. Thank you so much for putting this panel together. Um, I think it sounds like we all sort of like take for granted that like 
uh, or we all understand that investing in our employees is going to be good for the long term business and our goals. But there's a lot of founders and there's a lot of CEOs who view employment as transactional or have a little bit more of a like sink or swim mentality where if they can't figure something out, that's their problem. So are there levers or things we can do to sort of build more growth mindset in a sort of hostile environment, I guess, if that makes sense? So, I mean, I think first off, like for some people, like, and that might be the only option, right? For So for someone who's feeling like they cannot grow, I would say like, if you have the opportunity to reevaluate if you really want to to be in a space like that. But there are there are short-term decisions that have to be made sometimes. So I think of like I love diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think there's some like baseline tenants you can put in. But if you're trying to have a really robust DEI program, so much of it is education, but that's a long game, right? It's not like we're gonna make this change here, you're gonna do this training, it's gonna magically make your organization more inclusive, right? Leadership development is the same way. This is a long game. Um, and sometimes companies have to make decisions where it's like if if the if if the building's on fire right? Like you can't take the long game. There, there are some times where you have to make very fast and move very quickly. Um, so, but, but also there's going to be cost to not having training. Um, I've worked at organizations where it's like, they really don't have the space. They believe in it. They want to do it. But when push comes to shove, right, you can have every program in the world, but attendance would be lower. Even when people are sitting in the room, because, you know, even if it felt mandated, if their head's somewhere else, and they're not really creating the space to absorb or to shift, the train's going to go in one year and out the other. Um, so I think for for leaders, it's the same question that, that you were asking earlier. What are, why, if you're interested in it, why? Um, why is it important? And oftentimes I look at it. So if you're internally and you're saying, hey, I need to get my leaders to see that this is still important, I would have you ask yourself, what's the why there? Um, oftentimes if there's new managers and they don't really have a lot of even some of the training on the legalities. What can you say? What can't you say? I can't tell you how many times I've worked with newer managers and I'm like, what made you think that was a good idea? <laughs> um, oh and, and there's risk to that. There's actual risk to that, right? Um, and this is, society has changed. People are getting a lot of information from other places. There's a lot of, I don't know if it's increase in, in litigation, but you're hearing a lot more of, of, of litigation that's happening or threats of litigation. That's a real cost to an organization. So I like to start there, but then it's like, it shouldn't be a check the box. Do we actually want innovation, right? Do you actually want these things? And I just go back to like, look, there's proven studies that for organizations that work this way, this way, or this way, that these are the results that we can get. So I would say tie those to what the business is trying to accomplish. Let them see the short-term wins. And once they see that, they'll, they'll ideally be more willing to want to invest in it. And you can do things that are bite-sized. Like I said, I found things to do like pretty much at, at very low cost. And when people start seeing the wins there, they're going to be more apt to, to invest. The thing that I'll add, and I'm going to say this because it was the word that was given to me, was that I've had a couple of CEOs that have come and they wanted to do learning and development and bring it into the organization. But weirdly, and I've never heard this before, like two years ago, they um, three, I've had three people that have said, whatever we do, the first training that we have, I want it to be sexy. And I was like, hmm, okay, never heard sexy used before for learning and development, but got it. And I think what they mean by that is like, sexual harassment, compliance training, like that's not what they want to start off with. They want to start off with training that is like exciting. It's engaging. They want it to be maybe even fun. There might be a little less metrics and ROI to that, but they want people to be like, oh, wow, this is what the culture is about. Mm -hmm. the, I, I'm excited by this training. And so I would almost say that if you're building out a learning and development program, there might be some value in one of those first sessions being an external vendor to get people excited about what's to come. And then you can sprinkle in the other stuff, but making sure that right from the beginning, you're doing something exciting. The other piece is constantly like if you have that CEO that's like, whoa, 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 we're not spending that like, kind of money. We, we don't have the time for that. Trying to prove that there can be money saved. And so really aligning it with the business goals that they have. If it is around increased productivity or increased revenue, what is that specific training? Maybe it's a communications training where like they have to be in front of folks and speaking. And so if they're speaking more, if they're going to networking events or business events, maybe the focus is on that and making sure that folks are then presenting and trying to align that with new business in. Great. Thank you. 
Do we have Wonderful. time for one more? We have time for one more question. Um, and one of the themes that I'm seeing in the Q and a virtually is a lot of folks, um, honing in on the topic of sort of competency versus chemistry when it comes to interviewing and balancing that because to the point that was brought up earlier, there are certain technical skills that might be absolutely necessary. And also you want whatever that new hire is to sort of gel with the rest of the team. Um, so I'm curious, this might be a fun rapid fire thing. Do you have a favorite question to ask in interviews to be able to gauge maybe whether it's a technical based interview versus a competency base? What is like a key indicator that you open up this question and the response that you get from an applicant or employee is very telling? And if not, um, I guess, what's your general strategy kind of going into interviews like that? I'll do mine quick because mine is fast and you have far more experience <laughs> the two of you do than, uh, than I do in talent acquisition. Um, so we're a company of five, so we're small. And so one, every time that I meet someone, my one question is like, if I asked you to change your job tomorrow, how would that make you feel? Because as a team of five, like very often their job description that we had when they started may change three months in. And so I ask them that and I want to know like their gut reaction. And some of them may say like, oh God, that would make me crazy. I'm like, okay, then this is probably not the right fit. So. Okay. And I'm sorry, I'm going to try to do this as fast as possible because I have like lots of ideas here. So number one, I would say when it's chemistry versus competency in that, like I, that, that right there, I found myself cringing, like, no, 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 no. Competency, competency, competency. Um, Cause that's really important because honestly, it's nice when you like your team, but I also have learned more from people that I naturally would not hang out with, right? Like people that are not like my, but, but we are aligned because we're both, maybe we, we are aligned in our values, right? Because if you have a company with strong core values, you're able to cast a wider net um, across more talents. You get people that are a little bit, that are different, but we're all marching towards that same, that same goal. But I have learned so much from people that are different from me because they challenge me. They force me to give me a different perspective. And I love that. And I think that's where you get like best innovation is through a little bit of friction. Um, so I really worry about the chemistry. Like I hate the would you want to be stuck on a plane with them for 10 hours? Like I want to be stuck with one of my good friends. It doesn't mean I want to work with my good friend, you know? Um, and, and so there's, there's that aspect, right? And if you, if you find someone that challenges you and that you can be fun and you like amazing, but I would say chemistry first. Um, Cause I think that's really, really important. Now I base all my interview questions on values um, and competencies. That's what most of them are. Now, when it's a question that I like, I will say there's a couple of them, but they're not tied to this. Uh, there's two that I've, that I've heard before that I'm like, oh, that's that's good. I'll have to use these. And I have used them once in a while. One is um, think about, you know, everyone has those people that like we just click with and those people there is just like there's friction with. Right. Um, so I have them imagine both. And then I just say, how would this person describe you? How would that person describe you? Just to get curious, because right, because that's more of just to see, like, do they even have that self-awareness? I had one person be like, everyone loves me. And this is what they would say. And I was like, amazing. Like, <laughs> super excited. Uh, the other question that I love is, um, and this is one that that uh, my ex-husband actually got an interview, and I never forgot. I thought it was really great. It was, um, oh, how did it go? It was like, um, what's something that you can, what's something that people that have known you for a long time would be surprised to learn? Hmm. And I was like, huh, that's kind of interesting. I want to know what that is afterwards. I'm <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all so much. 